good evening everybody and uh, welcome back to OrthoHub. My name is Ramon Tamasebi, I'm one of the OrthoHub team and a surgeon down in London. Um, I'm delighted to introduce our panelists for this evening uh, and our uh, webinar tonight, as I'm sure you already know, is on periprosthetic joint in infections. Just before we get into that and before I start to introduce our chair for the evening, just a couple of bits of housekeeping from me. Um, hopefully you would have already seen or heard that we have got a couple of great bits of content that are just about to be released or were released uh, in the last few days. Uh, Cash and Pete have done another podcast this time with Paul Tornetta III, who uh, some of you may already know is one of the I guess biggest names in, in world orthopedic trauma surgery. Uh, he's a guy from the US with a fantastic story to tell and um, uh, tune in on the uh, website or on uh, the uh, other uh, channels to uh, view that. The next couple of bits of content are around our videos and we've started to create fantastic um, clinical examination videos. Our first I guess guest on that series is Tom Quick, who is an old friend of OrthoHub's, and he has filmed some incredible uh, video examinations of nerves. We have uh, recorded ulnar nerve already, radial nerve examination, and the uh, one that's just been released is the brachial plexus, and I think that's coming out in the next few days, so keep an eye out for that. After that, we're going to take a bit of a summer break because everyone's got better things to do, frankly, over the course of the next six weeks. And so we'll uh, hopefully come back fresh in September. We're already creating and recording loads of great new video content. Myself and Pete will be recording some surgical approach videos over the next few weeks and we'll record and release them in uh, the latter part of the year. So without further ado, I will introduce you to um, the host for this evening. Um, and let me introduce my old friend, uh, Abtin Alvand. Abtin is uh, a consultant orthopedic surgeon who works at the uh, renowned Nuffield Orthopedic Unit in Oxford. Um, he not only is a consultant there, but he is also the uh, director of the Knee Fellowship. Um, Abtin has huge experience in arthroplasty, revision arthroplasty, and of course infections. Uh, if you look him up on the NJR, you'll see that he's got one of the highest numbers of revision knee replacements to his name of anybody in the country. He's a proper academic as well, has completed a PhD at the University of Oxford. Um, he trained in Oxford. Uh, did a fellowship in Oxford, but also did a fellowship at the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital in Stanmore. He was the European Bone and Joint Infection Society Travelling Fellow a few years ago, has also done a fellowship at the Rothman Institute in the US. He uh, holds a, another prestigious role as an academic clinical lecturer for the NA, NIHR, and now he sits on an international consensus group for the management of periprosthetic infections. He's put together a fantastic panel of um, speakers who are actually part of his multidisciplinary team. So a really close knit group of people to give us um, a, a fantastic evening of teaching and training uh, tonight. So Abtin, I'm gonna pass over to you. Um, good night from me. Thank you, Ramon, for that flattering introduction. Um, hi everyone, and thank you first of all to Ramon, Cash, and the Author Hub team for inviting us. And um, thanks for everyone who's attending. We've got a fantastic uh, fa stellar faculty tonight. We're going to discuss probably one of the most important topics in my view in orthopedics at the moment, and it's probably one of the uh, sort of final fi frontiers of um, orthopedics, especially hip and knee surgery, and that's periprosthetic joint infection really difficult problem to treat. And we've seen now over the last uh, few years that the best way to manage these complex uh, patients is within a multidisciplinary team, not just orthopedic surgeons, plastic surgeons, or in infectious disease physicians, but also allied healthcare professionals, such as specialist nurses, physios, interventional radiologists, occupational therapists. So all these people are really important in the care. Tonight, <clears throat> because of time, we're, we're going to involve uh, orthopedic surgeons, plastic surgeons, and 
um, infectious disease physicians and we've got a really good exciting faculty and uh, one of the first one will be Dr Matt Scarborough who is um, uh, one of the consult uh, consultant uh, infectious disease physicians here in Oxford. Matt graduated from Belfast and then his early postgraduate experience was in medical education and also working in some refugee camps in the Middle East. He returned to the UK to do his um, specialist training and in and both in London and Oxford and then he went to Malawi for a while to uh, do some work on bacterial meningitis. Now he works in Oxford obviously as one of the lead uh, clinicians in our infectious disease unit and the bone infection unit and he also uh, carries out some general medicine work and obviously and, and as well as research he's got a uh, academic interest in, in local antibiotics in bone and joint infection as well as the infective uh, etiology of uh, back pain and the management of staph aureus bacteremia matt's a has a number of um, nihr grants to his name and he's been pivotal in one of the most um, important pieces of research, I think, in the last decade, uh, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine on the Oviva trial, which you'll talk about, and showing the benefits of um, oral antibiotics in um, the management of bone and joint infections. Then we've got Alex Ramsden, a colleague and friend of mine, uh, who is the clinical director of the uh, plastics department in Oxford. Um, he's been here for, uh, at the bone infection units for about 10 years now. He was one of the first uh, EBGIS European Bone and Joint Infection Society uh, traveling fellows in, uh, and he was in fact the first uh, plastic surgeon to go on this fellowship. He's a member of our MDT. He runs a, a, a Play a team of plastic surgeons managing chronic osteomyelitis, PJI, and fracture-related infections. 25% uh, of his work usually <clears throat> involves um, plastic. Uh, the infection work in Oxford involves plastic surgeon, and Alex really leads that for us. And he's uh, done his fellowships both in the UK and Australia before coming to Oxford. And um, apart from doing all these things, he also manages to tra uh, to swim across the English Channel and uh, also has worked in Antarctica. So he's got his hands full to some extent. And then last but not least, we've also got um, Antonia Chen, a, a friend and colleague of mine, an old friend of mine and uh, someone I worked with when I was over in the States. She's uh, an, an associate professor uh, in Harvard Medical School and she's a real, real true surgeon scientist. She's associate director of research um, uh, in previously in the uh, at Rothman Institute. She's currently the director of arthroplasty research in Brigham and Women's Hospital. She's um, uh, done her undergraduate degree at Yale, moving on to the Rutgers Medical School, where she also did an, did an MBA. And then her fellowship her residency was in Pittsburgh and fellowships in uh, Rothman Institute, and then she went took on a faculty there where I met her. She's published numerous papers, over 200 publications, 40 book chapters, multiple grants, and she was also the uh, past president of the Musculoskeletal Society, Infection Society, I beg your pardon. So um, we have a very good faculty and I'm really excited. We'll start off with uh, Dr. Matt Scarborough, who's going to talk to us about uh, the role of infectious disease physicians in the management of PJI. So please take it away, Matt. Thank you. Thanks, Ab. It's very kind of you to uh, introduce me so generously. Um, I'm going to talk uh, really just, just about what the ID physicians do in, in the Oxford unit. It's not necessarily the right thing to do, but it's the way we do it. There are several of us um, and uh, we rotate uh, around the uh, various parts of our service in infectious diseases. My email address is there. And if you want to contact us with the, to discuss either an observership or coming to visit us for a little while, just give us a shout. Also interested in anyone who's, uh, who wants to ask about our current research portfolio. There are lots of people involved in uh, infection, of course, the most important being the patient and sadly, most of the patients that we met have been through the mill several times, may have been through a number of different um, surgeries. So they're all pretty miserable sort of people. Most, um, I, I suppose the, the, the worst of it is that uh, someone has generally caused their problem. It's often another surgeon. It might be a driver of the, of the opposing car. It might be something else. But a third of our patients tend to be cross with the cause of their problem. A third are cross with us because we can't mend it. 
and the third a just plain cross because this is a really disabling condition which leads to prolonged hospitalization and often people don't get back to their former level of activity. Then of course we got the surgeons. When we started there was a colleague of mine who, who asked the uh, surgical trainees for the first word that came into their heads when they were told they were going to be working with uh, uh, orthopedic infection. These are the sort of words that came out um, from that survey. So of course most surgeons don't really want to acknowledge um, infection as a reality, but actually we have to embrace it in order to, um, in order to beat it. The physicians on the other hand, of course, like to perpetuate the myth that, um, that uh, we do all the thinking and the surgeons just come and do the technical work. Of course, that's not true. And we run our unit almost um, religiously along the lines of shared care. So we work with the surgeons um, and everything that we do is probably useless without good surgery. And similarly, most of what the surgeons do is probably not very useful without, without input from us and the other specialties, including physios, OTs, pharmacists and nursing staff. So when we first meet our patient, it's often in a clinic with other members of the team. This is Bridget Atkins, who's one of the, uh, um, one of the be best established ID physicians here and taught me most of what I know. Uh, there's Alex and uh, Martin McNally, who's, who's one of our surgeons. Um, all of our clinics are run along these lines where uh, we'll see either two or three consultants at one point. All of the clinics are very patient-centered. They tend to be efficient for the patients. And because we see the patient together, it means that we get an awful lot of learning done and a really good understanding of each other's roles. Most importantly, of course, it makes the clinics really good fun. Other patients are discussed initially or following clinic at our radiology MDT where other specialists are involved. And these includes all the subspecialties, including sarcoma um, surgeons, the arthroplasty surgeons, foot and ankle surgeons. And we, we, we spend quite a long time discussing individual cases here and often come out with a surgical and medical plan at the end of it. On the ward, of course, we have a much wider range of people involved. Um, this is a sort of sort of ward round that you might commonly see on a Tuesday or a Friday uh, once we're firing on all four cylinders. How can I justify the ID input? Well, I'm going to show you three, three studies. This is out of um, Pittsburgh, I think, um, where the surgeon was given either just the microbiology results and he had free reign to access the microbiologist if he wishes, or he was given an uninvited infectious diseases physician to come and uh, interfere with his patients. And even in the most complicated surgery, the outcome from when an infectious diseases physician had a 70% success rate as compared to 25% favorable outcome when this was just a surgeon with access to microbiology results. Overall, the involvement of other specialties, including infection, probably doubles the incidence of really favorable outcomes as compared to where people are left to their own devices to uh, manage surgical patients themselves. A similar study was done in South America where various, uh, where a number of variables were looked at as influences of outcome. And it turns out that um, in uh, treatment of osteomyelitis, again, if a surgeon is left to uh, manage the infections alone, it's a very, very marked predictor of an unfavorable outcome, and much more so even than the duration of therapy, the age of the patient, or the site and cause of osteomyelitis um, associated. The third study I want to show you um, is derived from data which has been gathered from a national registry. The data were collected by an independent company and analyzed as such. And the reason I'm, 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 um, I'm making that clear is because these, these are data from, from or relating to the Oxford Bone Infection Unit. So although I don't want to brag, um, uh, I, I think this is a really good example as to how an MDT really can improve outcomes. It's not necessarily the only MDT that does this, but it's, it, it's how the outcomes can be influenced by involving a broad range of people. What happened was uh, they looked at the coding for all patients treated surgically for osteomyelitis over a four-year period, and that amounted to around 25,000 patients. Of those, only about 340 were treated in our unit over that period. Remember, this is restricted to long bone osteomyelitis, and there were 25,000 cases of throughout the rest of England, 
Within those 25,000, there was nearly 3,000 from the top 10 numerically most busy centres other than Oxford. And the first finding is that our amputation rate was around about 6% at two years post uh, uh, primary surgery or first, um, first surgery at our centre. That compared to 16 or so percent elsewhere. Um, and it may be that we are particularly um, selective of our patients. I don't think that's the case. It might be that we strive very, very hard to avoid amputation, which isn't necessarily always the right thing to do. But if this is a crude marker of favorable outcome, I think it points in the right direction. The second thing, and we were surprised about this, is that mortality at a specialist multidisciplinary team meeting was much lower at two years than it was at a, 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 at a, 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 a secondary care center. Um, so when we looked at these figures, um, the commonest cause of death in these uh, centers outside of a specialist tertiary referral place, um, the commonest cause of death was sepsis or infection. Sepsis or infection was the eighth commonest cause in Oxford. So maybe we get a, a mortality advantage because we treat infection very aggressively. Um, of course, these are, uh, these are very crude data, but I think the, the numbers are very much in favor of the way that we're doing things currently. Thirdly, you might say these are complicated cases. Do we go back to theater more frequently? What happens is that actually we've got a much lower return to theater rate in Oxford as there are in the other two uh, cohorts that we looked at here. So all in all, we think we save limbs, save lives and save money by having a dedicated unit with surgeons who are dedicated to managing infection. And that's important because our unit actually does cost a lot of money and it runs at a loss when you look at the tariff payments currently. So in order to justify our existence, these data were very important to, um, to demonstrate to our management that we shouldn't be uh, sidelined or, 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 or shrunken in any way. What do I do as an infectious disease physician? Well, of course, I try to make the patient um, fit for surgery. That includes things like smoking cessation, making their diabetes uh, better or better controlled, making sure they've got good vascular supply. And in almost all cases, we'll try and stop antibiotics at least two weeks before any operations performed. That's because at the time of sampling, we want to optimize our microbiological diagnostics. We are probably an outlier in the fact that we do very little preoperative diagnostic sampling. And I'll go through some of the, uh, some of the indications for that in, in the next slide. But the reason that we do very little is because we know that the best samples are available at the time of open surgery. That's where the surgeon can see the samples that, that are most likely to uh, provide the, the, the highest yield in terms of culture or histology. Very occasionally we'll do preoperative sampling when the diagnosis is not clear or um, when it's an exotic infection such as TB where surgery may not be indicated in the first place. But those are relatively rare. Occasionally we'll do preoperative sampling if we want to distinguish between single and two stage um, revision surgery. In my mind, a single biopsy sample taken preoperatively is not sufficiently sensitive to make that dis decision upon. Um, because it's prone to sampling error. And of course, it's only a one or at the very most two samples that you've got to interpret. The third um, indication sometimes is the choice of a local antibiotic that the surgeon wants to implant at the time of operation. I think there are marginal gains here, and it's really only in cases where we think there's a high risk of a multi-drug resistant uh, bug. So the only time when we use it routinely is when we're treating patients without surgeries. These are people who are going to put on long-term suppressive antibiotic, and we want to target the antibiotic as best we can. So I mentioned intraoperative sampling earlier on, and this is probably the most important slide for me, because this is the surgical set that is given to each of the surgeons that operate on potentially infected cases here. We rely very, very heavily on five individual and separately taken samples, each taken out with clean instruments and separately labeled as their origin. Now that's all important because if we don't get the, if we don't know the bug, then it's very, very hard for us to determine what's the most appropriate antibiotic. We also rely very heavily on samples for histology because histology we believe to be the gold standard 
investigation for the diagnosis of infection. And it's a much more sensitive test than microbiology. But of course, it doesn't give us all of the information that microbiology does. After sampling is done, then the surgeon can start broad spectrum antibiotics. And we tend to um, start very broad and then focus down within the next 48 hours or so. We currently use meropenem and vancomycin. And that's because um, these data were from about 10 years ago with one of our registrars looked at 166 consecutive patients and worked out which antibiotic was most likely to cover the bugs that we subsequently identified. And it turns out that the combination of vancomycin and for example, meropenem provided the highest coverage regardless of whether they'd had previous metal work or not. Um, so that's what we've stuck with. We've repeated those data more recently with Maria, who's a, a, another of our research fellows, and exactly the same results um, uh, um, were obtained from these uh, more recent data. Of course, just because we use vancomycin and meropenem doesn't mean to say it is the only right thing to do. There are lots of alternative anti-pseudomonal penicillins. And there's lots of other agents that might be more appropriate depending on local epidemiology risks and, uh, and the local resources. And of course, we often have to individualize antibiotic choice according to previous history and previous microbiology results. So this is an important slide uh, because it reminds me that we rely very, very heavily on Alex and the uh, plastic surgeons who come along after the orthopods um, and although it isn't a PJI, of course, it just demonstrates that if you have an orthopedic surgeon who's sufficiently reassured that he can take out as much tissue as necessary to remove the dead, abnormal or non-vital tissue, the outcomes are likely to be much better. So this is a segmental resection of an osteomyelitis. There's still some bone here that isn't bleeding. So I suspect that our surgeon went back and cut off more of this bone. But he wasn't worried about it because he knew that he could handle this. because He's got Alex to come and help fill in the gap and achieve primary closure. And primary closure is really critical for our practice. Um, um, and we go to extreme lengths to try and avoid any delayed closure uh, uh, where possible. After our um, surgery, um, we tend to stop our gram negative cover, so our meropenem at 48 hours. We continue with a gram positive cover and for most gram positives other than streps, we go on to use dual agents. What helps us in formulating our antibiotic plan is the detail that's available in the operation notes or by discussion with the surgeon. And we'll often go to the theatres to ask the surgeon specifically about the findings of the operation. It really is very, very um, helpful to us to have as much detail as possible um, as to the uh, surgical findings. We choose our definitive antibiotics uh, according to susceptibility and pharmacokinetics. Susceptibility, of course, is, is key, but we only get that probably in 80% because about 20% of our cases are culture negative. Pharmacokinetics includes oral bioavailability, tissue penetration, um, and uh, metabolism. We also think about other drugs the patients are on, um, the treatment aim, and finally we think about things such as uh, the risk of a, uh, resistance and the cost of therapy. The duration of antibiotic therapy is much more complicated, and there aren't very many prospective data that, uh, that uh, give us the answer to this. It is, however, influenced by whether or not there's metalware present. It's influenced to a certain extent by the bug that we find, and um, to a large extent by the surgical notes, as I've uh, just mentioned. Generally speaking, we are reducing the length of therapy as time goes on. When I started in 2009, we were routinely treating patients for a year or two years for those that managed with DARE. And that led to this trial, which was conducted by some of my colleagues here. Um, this was a series of about 112 patients treated by DARE. In the solid line along the top, these are the patients that were on antibiotics, and we had around about 5% failure whilst the patient was on antibiotics. If you then re restart the clock for patients who are treated for six months, more than six months or a year, they all have a similar failure rate um, uh, about two thirds of a year after stopping antibiotics. So 
the, the, the story here is really that continuing antibiotics beyond six months delays failure rather than reduces the risk per se. So unless you want to carry on treating indefinitely, there is probably little advantage of extending the treatment period beyond six months um, at the most. There have been some prospective trials. These were some trials out of Spain trying to compare duration of therapy in hip and knee infections, all caused by Staph aureus and all, all treated by a uh, quinolone and rifampicin. Unfortunately, this trial recruited for some time across a number of centers, but they didn't get sufficient patients. They needed 195 and they probably got up to 63. There were sufficient data in uh, the intention to treat analysis to say that at least in patients managed for hip joint infections, eight weeks therapy was non-inferior to 12 weeks therapy. We couldn't make the same conclusion from knee joints because there weren't sufficient data. So we now treat our hips generally for three months and our knees for six months, and we await further data. I think far more compelling is this research from the spinal uh, community looking at vertebral osteomyelitis. And they looked at quite a large number of patients in each group. And very clearly, there was non-inferiority between patients treated with six months, sorry, six weeks as compared to 12 weeks. This was not metalware related uh, uh, infection. So my sort of conservative rules of thumb, and I tend to be more conservative than many of my colleagues, as I say, is that if the surgeon's confident about resection, and there's no metal at the end of the surgery, six weeks is sufficient. Um, if it's a two stage uh, with a long fallow interval afterwards, then six weeks is enough for, uh, for um, dare in the, in the hip and other joints other than the knee, 12 weeks is what we'll do, 24 weeks for knees. Of course, with fracture-related fracture infection, you treat until union or removal of the metal. Um, a lot of us are very wedded to the CRP. Um, and it's very, very difficult to get rid of that. It's often used as a single indicator as to whether or not there is infection and to whether or not you can stop antibiotics. So I want to show you a little bit of information from two trials. One's from Javid Parvizi, who looked at stage revision in, uh, in knee arthroplasty infections. And he looked at the utility of the CRP in predicting infection following stage revision. Now, an area under the curve of 0 0.50 would be exactly the same as tossing a coin. And here you can see it's only measuring the CRP is marginally better than tossing a coin in trying to predict whether your patient's going to fail or not. And the same was true for ESR. Of course, you don't use CRP alone, but I still think we tend to rely on it too heavily. So I'm going to show you some more data from our unit, which looked at infections after DARE. Um, or after first stage, it doesn't matter which one you look at. But we look at DARE. The patients in blue are those with CRPs who went on to uh, have a successful outcome at two years. And the patients in red are those with CRPs who went on to have a failure. And you can see that even very early on when the CRP is flat, there are a number of people who went on to fail. Similarly, there are a huge number of people, even fairly late, who had high CRPs who went on to succeed. And the confidence intervals overlap each other entirely. So the CRP doesn't do very much more than your clinical acumen can. Where does it fit in? I think it is a very tiny, tiny um, variable in a very large equation, which we're aiming for, and that is cure but it is really, really small. The biggest variable, of course, is your patient and how they look, how they feel. What about root of antibiotic administration? For a long time, we've been, we've been giving parenteral antibiotics, and this is based on an old paper from 1970, uh, which suggested that for best outcome, you needed high dose, prolonged course of intravenous antibiotic therapy. We challenged that um, with the OVIVA trial, where we randomized patients to either oral therapy or intravenous therapy, at least for the first six weeks of their post-operative management. Patients after six weeks were allowed to carry on with oral antibiotics if we thought that was the appropriate thing. But during that first six weeks, they had to reach their 
that, that they had to be allocated to their randomized strategy within seven days of surgery. And we followed them up to a year with definitive treatment failure as the primary endpoint. And these are the results on a forest plot. It doesn't really matter which population you look at. So we'll, we'll look up here. Um, it, the upper bound of the 90% confidence interval doesn't cross the predefined non-inferiority point, not non-inferiority margin, sorry. And therefore we can conclude that there's no advantage of IVs over orals in this population. And this is what the result looks like graphically. The other important thing that this Captain Meyer plot shows is that those patients who fail on oral therapy don't fail any earlier than those on IV therapy. So we concluded that PO therapy was non-inferior to IV therapy. This is a slide that I tried to fit into all my talks. It happens to be my wife and some of my kids together with our statistician and um, 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 trial manager spelling the word Oviva. But the outcome really is that we can reduce the risk of uh, complications from IV lines and we can improve our antimicrobial stewardship. We can save quite a lot of money per patient by giving oral therapy and we can get patients home a mean of three days earlier on oral therapy than on IV therapy. So the next thing we have to think about is what about local antibiotics? The theoretical advantage is that we can have very high concentration at the site of infection with limited systemic exposure and toxicity. There are, of course, some concerns around resistance emergence and uh, the difference between the various carriers, but um, we still think this is uh, eligible for further investigation. And it's based on some fairly, fairly scarce observational data. These were from the Sheffield Teaching Hospital where they rely very heavily on local antibiotics. Um, and this was a group of 114 patients uh, after a two-stage exchange atheroplasty, and they get uh, outcomes very similar to what we get in, uh, in, in Oxford, even though they use virtually no post-operative systemic antibiotics. There's a similar um, case series, it's only 13 patients, but these were all complicated patients with multiple previous surgeries in the Lebanon, um, all of whom did very well, and they used only uh, um, local antibiotics once the patient had recovered fully from um, anesthesia, so that they were allowed uh, systemic antibiotics for up to five years, and they all did very well. What we really need, though, is a prospective randomized control trial with appropriate um, um, uh, economic evaluation and uh, surveillance for resistance. And I'm pleased to say that we are now 250 patients out of 500 into a trial called the Solario trial, where we're randomizing patients within seven days to either continue systemic antibiotics or to stop antibiotics. All patients will have had antibiotics in, inserted locally at the time of surgery. So just to conclude, I'm just going to tell you just a couple of my foibles. First of all, when you do send samples, the, the, the a surface swab is almost useless because it's almost bound to be contaminated by skin organisms. It doesn't tell us much. Similarly, a sinus um, or a swab from a sinus is, is not going to give us very much information. What we really need to get for diagnosis are deep surgical samples. The second thing to say is that treatment failure doesn't equate to antibiotic failure, it is often source control. And that's nothing to be proud or embarrassed about, but there's very, very little gain to be had by saying, let's switch to IV antibiotics, or let's add another antibiotic, or let's use a broader spectrum antibiotic. If you've got the bug, then you almost certainly have the right antibiotic. And thirdly, as I've said, the CRP tends to be overused in my mind. Um, involve an MDT, hold off antibiotics before sampling if you can, and uh, try and encourage a religiously obsessive sampling framework. Lastly, um, our antibiotics are precious. You're probably aware that uh, we're on the serious threat of losing many of our most useful antibiotics. So involve someone to help with the choice, dose, route, and duration. Many thanks for listening. Great. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, Alex and Antonio, if you can uh, pop your mics on and your uh, videos, great, thank you. Um, that was a great talk, Matt, thank you. I, I was just gonna ask you uh, a couple of questions. Um, first of all, you did mention, Matt, about the psychological effects of um, <clears throat> periprosthetic joint infection, and that's something that's been sort of 
uh, sort of underplayed to some extent. And do you think that that's going to be looked into, into in, with a bit more detail? And do you think that's a real problem? Or are we just seeing the worst of the worst in some of the reference centers? No, I think I, you're, you're absolutely right, Hampton. It is really disabling both physically and psychologically. Um, you, can, you can look at periprothetic joint infection or bone and joint infection in general, and the outcomes, both in terms of mortality and function, are worse than some, well, than, than three of our five most common cancers. The difficulty with bone and joint infection is that it doesn't have the emotional heartstrings that cancers do, and therefore we, we aren't afforded the luxury of counsellors um, and, and um, uh, therapists in that way. We have uh, done a small trial trying to get uh, somebody involved in, in maintaining the morale of patients, but it's very difficult to measure um, and it's very difficult to translate into practice. But we did have someone who came on and taught, taught various crafts to our patients to keep them engaged and occupied, particularly our long stayers. I don't know, I don't know uh, where, it, where it falls when we, we, you and I tend to think about infection as our outcome. Actually, it's much, much more broad than that. And it's the patient's function in the end that we really need to optimise. Yeah. And Alex, I think you've probably seen, we know that the Burns community, the Burns patients who are dealt with by plastic surgeons have a lot of overlay psychological issues. And do you see that with some of the PJI cases? I mean, some of the things we deal with, we see patients with large wounds, morbidity from donor sites. Do you see that in your clinics post-op or is, is that a thing? Well, I, I think a lot of the patients arrive in our clinic pretty psychologically and physically scarred. <clears throat> And, and have great difficulty. And actually arriving in a clinic where you see lots of people who are actually interested in infection, as opposed to an orthopedic surgeon who's not interested in infection, it, mm. they, they find that quite inspiring that they're in the, in the right place. And also yeah. people listen to what they say and are sympathetic. And they see a waiting room full of 20 other people all with frames on and stories of infection that have been um, appropriately treated. And I, and I think that really helps people. We're also lucky in that the patients who get sent to us are told, oh, you're going to Oxford, you know, it's a specialist centre. And actually they come positive that they're actually getting some treatment. So, yeah, it, it's, it's similar in plastics. There's lots of psychological overlays to all the surgery um, and big wounds, big scars definitely take their toll on people. And, and the other thing as well is that people with open wounds, they're fighting infection all the time and they're losing huge amounts of resource, protein, their nutrients are all coming out through their wound and actually they feel tired and depleted physically as well as psychologically when they come they're very and and you can actually tell when you've treated them successfully rather than looking at their crp actually you can look, look at the the rosiness of their cheeks and actually they look like they're cured yeah they look i agree with that um, antonio just changing tax uh, uh just briefly we, 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 we know that there's infection disease centers and multidisciplinary teams in the UK, and we're trying to set up some networks. What's the situation across the pond? And do you think um, it's the healthcare system's different and it's a lot more complicated over there? Do you think, uh, and what are the, the, what's the future looking for like in terms of the sort of management of PJI? Is it all just coming to you guys or are you trying to set up networks around the, re the uh, states, etc.? So we want to be like you guys when we grow up. So hopefully we can do what you're doing. Um, it's really hard here. So we don't have a nationalized healthcare system. So none of that can be mandated, right? So most of our patients will probably stay local. They prefer to get their treatment local. They did everything locally at first. And only after normally one or two treatments, or if they're an orthopedic surgeon or the consultants that they're working with um, do not feel comfortable, then will they actually forward them to someone else. So we really haven't been developing the networks. Um, there've been some publications lately, especially in the Journal of Arthroplasty in the US that say that it would actually be very helpful to have specialized networks. Uh, we obviously have teams like you guys who are lucky to have infectious disease specialists, plastic surgeons, people we work with very closely on a regular basis for periprosthetic joint infection. But similar to you guys, when we get them, by then they've actually been under undergone a lot of different treatments normally. So we are trying to establish them to some degree, but to be perfectly honest, there's not a well-accepted norm here in the United States. 
Okay, that's no, that's great. So I think we've got a few questions coming in. I'm going to ask Matt some uh, questions later, but for the sake of time, we're going to move on to Antonia's talk. There's there's a question about vac dressing and wound oozing. We'll get to that after Alex's talk. So uh, now we're going to move on to Antonia's talk, and she's going to talk about the sort of orthopedic management of hip and knee PJI. Antonia, uh, take it away, please. Thank you. If you share your screen. Perfect. Can you guys still hear me? All right. So thank yeah. you all. Really appreciate this opportunity to be here as being the uh, lone U.S. representative. Um, we have a lot to learn from our U.K. colleagues, and we're very thankful for that. So I'm going to touch briefly on the treatment of PJI. As um, those who take care of PJI, we know that this talk itself can be uh, a, a whole conference or a whole lecture for multiple days. But I'm going to condense it to a small area from a you know, hip and knee surgeon aspect. These are my disclosures, none of which are directly relevant to this talk. So how would you treat this patient? They come into your clinic, they've got some open wounds. Do you give them antibiotics? Do you dare them? Do you do one stage exchange, two stage exchange, fusion or amputation? I'm not gonna focus on antibiotics because we know uh, Dr. Scarborough is the expert when it comes to antibiotics. And most patients that we're taking care of are not so sick that you can't do a debridement and then do antibiotics afterwards. So what test would you take or what would you do in terms of steps of taking care of this patient? So we'd like to delineate between acute versus chronic. In 90 days, it depends on which definition you use, the Texayuma one, the Zimmerly classification, the MSIS, or the ICM classifications of acute versus chronic ranges from one month to three months in terms of delineation. And why is that important? Well, if people consider an acute infection, an acute is defined as from the time frame of the index procedure or the, in, the incidence of starting of symptoms, potentially could do a quote unquote, less invasive procedure. For example, you could do DARE. In the chronic infections, potentially DARE may not work as well, but that paradigm is shifting as we're talking over time. And this talk if it's given in 10 years from now could be totally different than what I'm saying now. ESR is elevated in both cases as, long as, as well as CRP. Also cell count is elevated, but at different levels. So the cell count of 27,800 is for total knees, about 12,500 for total hips. And the cell count ranges in literature between 1,000 to 4,000 for chronic diagnosis. And then polymorphonucleosides, again, higher in the acute setting than the chronic setting. Once you make this delineation, how do you treat your patients? This is the Tecayuma classification where it says positive intraoperative culture, so that's type one. And the ones we're really looking for DARE is normally the early postoperative period. And again, this is within one month or an acute hematogenous source. So a patient who's gone to the dentist, for example, or gone to colonoscopy. And the last one is late chronic period, which is inoculation potentially at the time of surgery, but the infection doesn't rear its ugly head until much later. The McPherson classification is another one too, where you take an infection type, systemic host grade, and local extremity grade. And the ones that are highlighted are the ones that are normally early infections, again, early postoperative infections, hematogenous, potentially they're uncompromised, then they could become a candidate for DARE. The Zimli classification looks at three months. So the early phase versus the late phase, but the late phase has an acute onset of pain, fever, erythema, or bacteremia. And potentially these are seated hematogenous, then again, can be treated with a different method than other ways. This is the ICM PGI definition. Again, this delineates chronic, acute versus chronic in these areas. So now that we've established the infection factor, how do we treat these? So DARE is a commonly used term, obviously in, in the UK, but in the US, we also use irrigation debridement and polyethylene exchange. So DARE stands for debridement, antibiotic, irrigation, and retention. Again, the idea is to retain the prosthesis, which is good for the patient, less morbid, less bone loss, et cetera. This is defined as normally with or without polyethylene exchange, but I personally like to change the polyethylene every single time because it gives you access to the entire joint. For example, if you remove the polyethylene you can get to the back of the knee, you can't get it back to the cup, especially if it's a monoblock cup, but you can get access to the screw hole shells and you can just do a much more thorough debridement. So the question is, should we use a term like D-A-I-E-R when we talk about this procedure? When you do any of these treatments, the first thing to do, whether it be a dare, a one stage or a two stage is to do a deep, deep debridement. I'm talking about tumor surgery. You wanna go in and I call it excavation. You wanna take all the gutters out. You wanna take all the tissue out. Some places even take out the medial and lateral, collig lateral, collimates, you, uh, lateral collateral ligaments. You can't do that in a dare because then you would have an unstable joint. You take everything out and that's more for a one stage approach, but you wanna do the deepest clean you can without hurting the soft tissue structures or the balance or the stability of the joint. 
Again, if you're removing the polyethylene, you remove this so you can get access to more parts of it. You debris more, you can trial again with a new implant and you irrigate, trial and reimplant. In this process, and we'll walk through this a little bit, is you wanna use clean instrumentation, a brand new setup and everything. The guys who are really good at the Oxford are very good about taking different samples of different things and making sure you clean it all out. How do you clean? So the problem is when you have metal present, you have biofilm present and it is adherent to this metal. And we can't see it, at least not yet. There's technologies that are being developed so you can see this biofilm. So you need to physically disrupt this biofilm. What are ways you can do that? People use sterile brushes sometimes. Sometimes use, people use pulse lavage, but the downside about pulse lavage is it can actually drive bacteria into the tissue, which is what we're trying to avoid. You can use these systems here that use more ultrasonic systems where you can actually place it on the implant surface itself. Some surgeons don't feel comfortable doing it because they're afraid it might loosen the implant, but so far studies have not shown that. So you can use that or you can use a sterile toothbrush even. Um, those at uh, Mayo, Arizona advocate using a sterile toothbrush to brush down the implant to make sure you have a physical disruption of the biofilm that's present. Then you want chemical disruption, and that's where irrigation comes in. I use a minimum of nine liters. Some people may use 12 to 15 liters. We have these big three liter bags that you can put up and just irrigate the wound with that. You can use povidone iodine, but you wanna make sure that it's sterile. Uh, hydrogen peroxide, 3%. You can also use a Dakin solution, which is hypochloric acid. You can do acetic acid and they recommend 4%. And you can do chlorhexidine, which is 0.05% as well too in this formulation, but there's different formulations. Now, the only thing you want to be concerned about with any of these irrigations is you don't want it to be cytotoxic to the remaining tissue. Now, you've already removed the joint because that was done previously. So you're not worried about chondrocytes, but you are worried about toxicity to the remaining surrounding soft tissue. After debridement, what do you do? That's when you wanna change everything. Change your gloves, some people change their gowns. When you definitely wanna change instruments. Some people put a separate, I personally put a separate setup where it's all separate from all the other instruments that you had before. You literally take the bat, dirty instruments, you put it to the side and cover it out. Some people take it out of the room uh, and then you bring in the new instruments, change gloves, gowns, everything like that. So you're brand new and fresh again. That way you can don't carry the bio burden or the biofilm or the planktonic bacteria from the first case or the first half of the case, to the second half of the case. Then you want to make sure everything looks clean at that point in time, but that's only obviously a visual inspection. Place in the new polyethylene, and you can add, add adjuvants to it. So this is obviously Dr. Scarborough is much better at this than I am, but you can do calcium sulfate impregnated with antibiotics. And ideally, you know the organism before you're doing this procedure, because then you can direct the antibiotics appropriately intraarticularly as well as intravenously or oral. Um, antibiotic powder and chitosan and sponges, again, can be infused with these antibiotics or this antibiotic powder and placed in there. The antibiotic powder doesn't elute for a long time. It's a shorter acting versus the calcium sulfate and the chitosan sponges can actually do it for longer. These are predictors of DARE failures. So the problem is success in literature ranges from 0% to 90%. It's a huge range. So on average, it's about half and half is what I tell patients. If you have prolonged duration of symptoms, if you have presence of a sinus tract, if you're unable to close the wound, and this is where Dr. Ramsen would be very helpful about closing the wound. If you have unstable implants, if they're immunosuppressed or high American Association of uh, Anesthesiology classification of three or four, if the organism is difficult to treat, if there's a DARE history of the index joint, so they already did a DARE, or there's an arthroscopic DARE already performed, these patients have a much higher likelihood of failure. And you really want to question yourself whether or not you want to do a DARE right off the bat, or if you want to consider something more stringent and, more, and better at potentially removing the biofilm. One of those options is one-stage exchange arthroplasty. It's a single procedure with complete removal of infected parts with debridement of the infected tissue. It's normally used in patients with a maintained soft tissue envelope. So a patient here has a small sinus tract because you can see the fluid and the purulence coming out, but the tissues are closable. So the soft tissue envelope is maintained. If you know the organism, because if you know the organism, you can direct treatment accordingly. And if a patient has oral antibiotic tolerance, this is really not yet a gold standard in the US. It's becoming more and more common in the UK and, the U and Europe. You guys have taken it on before we did. So we're still learning on that process. How to perform a one-stage exchange. What do you wanna do is explain all components using cement. And I'm gonna go back and actually talk about one, one thing and something we'll discuss probably in, this, in the discussion session is whether or not a sinus tract is a, is a true um, contraindication. So how do you perform one stage exchange? You wanna explain all components, including the cement if possible. So these are cement removal tools that I use routinely. Um, you wanna thoroughly debris. We've talked about this in the DARE setting, copious irrigation. 
I'm going to do a loose closure of the wound over betadine soaked sponges. That's personally my use of choice. I use a baseball stitch. I take Ioban and cover over it. And then room is entirely cleaned. Now in some facilities, they're lucky. They have extra rooms available so they can actually wheel the patient into a brand new fresh room. So you can leave all that bio burden behind from the previous room. If you don't have that alternative, which most facilities don't, you can just clean the entire room, including the floor, equipment, everything you need to. All the staff comes out, changes scrubs, open new instruments, and literally open the new instruments at that time, as opposed to having a covered set then reprep the surgical site, place the new implants with the antibiotics imprinted in cement, and then you close it. The benefits it has comparable rates of infection control and low infection rates and high success rates. But this has been done in the hands of people who've done this multiple, multiple times. Again, it's a shorter hospital stay as opposed to a two-stage exchange, which is two hospital visits. It's cheaper, again, one only one hospital stay, good functional outcomes, and then less antibiotic administered because you don't have a double dose of that. But the limits is we don't have good multi-center studies, which are currently being done right now. So there's a more large randomized controlled trials being done um, in multiple places. Um, the biggest one here is through Ortho Carolina, and they've actually obviously included many, many sites as part of it. There is potentially uh, risk of reinfection. And if you do remove a lot of the soft tissue, like collaterals, like you see to the right here, you'll end up with a hinge. And in those patients is the longevity of the implant compromised because of that but it may be helpful to have local antibiotics delivery at the time of surgery. And that's really only afforded in a two-stage exchange because you're going to do it a high, high dose delivery and then come back and place it in the actual implant. So when should you use two-stage exchange? PGA patients who are septic, so you need to remove the prosthesis and you don't want to place something in, in that setting, ideally. If you don't have good soft tissue coverage, if you have not just a sinus tract, but a gaping open wound. Uh, infected resistant organisms. And then after a failed debridement of the prosthesis, you're more likely to do a two-stage exchange. Again, debridement is the name of the game. And the benefit of a two-stage exchange is you don't just to get debrid once, you get to debrid twice. You remove all the foreign material, again, including PMMA if possible. Now, if there's a very, very well set cement mantle, especially in the femur and a total hip that you cannot remove and you cannot remove safely, then potentially you can keep some of it, but ideally you want to remove everything possible. Take cultures for analysis, place an antibiotic spacer. And I'll talk about the spacers in just a minute. Directed antibiotics. We still do it for six weeks. Obviously this is a debated topic. Reimplantation after no signs of infection. The wound is healed. Serology such as ESR, CRP trend towards normal, although 20% can still be abnormal according to literature. You aspirate the fluid, it might be difficult to get fluid. The cell count is low and a patient's a surgical candidate and you wanna use antibiotic cement at the time of reimplantation. It might be the premixed one because it tends to be stronger and have better integrity. So the goal of cement spacers are to confect and, and control the infection. You want to be doing delivery of antibiotics at a time, and you want to maintain and protect the soft tissues. The two main types are articulating versus non-articulating, and they have similar rates of reinfection. reinfection. So they both do the same thing in maintaining joint space, but non-articulating ones, they are easier to make and they tend to be cheaper, but the problem is their range of motion is less. For articulating ones, they can dislocate or fracture. This is a version where it's actually all cement. It is much more expensive if you use the all cement one because there's a mold with it or new implants, but you do have increased range of motion. These are the different types that are used. The ones that were used most commonly were cement on cement. And I think this has fallen out of favor a little bit over time. More and more people are using like an all new, brand new femur. So an older femur probably. Um, and then an all polytibia, and then you balance them and you put in stems up and down and you can create the cement mantle as needed. For non-articulating spacers, some people just put a wad of cement in there. Most people probably put a rod for some sort of stabilization, whether it be K wires with cement around it or a tibial nail or a humeral nail or an X, old X fix. Um, they all depend on cost. The advantage is that joint immobilization reduces inflammation. Um, one of my attendings back in residency used to say, if it doesn't move, it can heal. But the problem is you do have reduced limb and joint function and potentially bone loss, and then a difficult time reimplanting during the second stage. For antibiotics, they can elute up to three months. Again, it's thermally stable. The most commonly used ones are vancomycin and tobramycin because they're available as powders. Gentamicin is only available as a powder um, in the US and uh, Mayo Clinic. I personally use two bags, two grams of vancomycin and 2.4 grams of tobramycin um, for most infections against staph aureus in each 40 gram bag of cement. Some people go up to three grams or four grams, but I do worry about acute kidney injury. If you want to, the best way to get the most antibiotic solution is to mix the cement first, then add the antibiotics. 
and this will give us some strength as well as ability to elute. So here are some um, here are some ones here that talk about different types of antibiotics. This is for gram positive bacteria. This is for gram negative bacteria, and this is for antifungals. So these are more organism specific antibiotics you can use. I'm not going to go in depth about antibiotics because uh, my colleague Dr. Scarbo knows this well. Two to six weeks of intravenous antibiotic based on osteomyelitis treatments we normally use, and then three months of oral. Sometimes people will do three months for hips and six months for knees. Reimplantation, if the patient has, doesn't have an infection that's controlled, is medically unfit. If they have neurologic or vascular impairment or soft tissue deficiency, if this is what their knee looks like, you're going to have a really hard time reimplanting. So in those cases, you're thinking about limb salvage versus amputation. You're thinking more amputation if there's poor bone stock, insufficient bone stock and poor bone quality, foreign material present, inadequate muscle function, poor soft tissue coverage, or an ongoing infection. In those cases, fusion might not be as good as amputation. And then when you're closing, don't forget to use uh, suture that does not have, um, uh, it's not uh, braided. So you want to have non-braided suture. So I do interrupted, for example, PDS here, um, put a dressing on tonic. Some people just use a regular dressing. Some people prefer to use an incisional vac or use a, a true wound vac over the incision, especially if you're worried about skin healing. So in conclusion, the treatment of PJ depends on timing. If acute, most people use DARE. If you have a brand new total hip that was placed in only like two or three weeks ago. Some people will take out the entire thing and do a one stage exchange at that time frame. For chronic, you might consider one versus two stage. And in the future, hopefully I can dream to see everything treated by DARE because our treatments using antibiotics, phages, all sorts of different elements can actually improve our ability to treat our patients. Thank you very much. That's great, Antonia. Thank you very much. Um, I think the take home message there, one of the, the key messages there for me was excavation. I think the embryonment is really, really important. And as you said, it really needs to be a, a critical part of your uh, your um, surgery and that, that's where people like Alex and the plastic surgical colleagues come into it. Um, for the same reason, I think the, there was another issue with the, the dare is that you can't do that level of uh, sort of debridement and you mentioned highlighted some of the benefits of uh, there and also some of the contraindications or high risk there so let's let's call it so those in so i think the the questions that people want often ask is that you know when do you think a dare is not enough and i think you highlighted that well with those risk factors we sometimes do uh, do dares in chronic cases etc uh, in our unit and i think we've looked at this and we know that if patients do survive a dare as you said their functional outcome is better than staged ex ex exchange and if their functional outcomes slightly worse than primary cases but better than stage exchange so do you think that um, with with there is a limit to there if for example you have a um, a uh, all poly tibia which you can't uh, change do you think that, that you would go straight to a, a, a single stage or would you look more at the host and the other factors that you mentioned so the high the, the organisms for example that's the hard part that's the whole other conversation is what's the host goals what's the patient's goals and what do you think you can achieve with it so again all poly tibia can't get to the back um, and people do just irrigate and debride, right? And that removal of bile burden makes a big difference. So I have a, a, a discussion with the patient. Some patients are like, I want a one and done. Don't make me go back underneath the knife if I can help it. So in those cases, one exchange exchange is a, a more feasible option. Yeah. Um, a patient's yeah. like, you know what? I am debilitated. If you go through that whole thing again, I don't think I'll survive. So in those cases, it becomes a little bit harder to justify um, doing more than a dare. So it is one of those things why I think the DARE success rate is so variable, right? Is that sometimes you have 0% if you treated every MRSA patient like this. And it's also the threshold of the surgeon too. If you're willing to take that risk with the patient, then you can do so. So I hope we do more and more DARES. I think that'll be better for our patients long-term, but we'll yeah. see how that goes. Okay, that's great. And Matt, do you think there's any organisms that you would probably tell us not to do a DARE on there with, in your opinion, or do you think they're specifically very high risk, some of our difficult to treat organisms, or would you think from your experience over the years that we should be trying to go for a DARE where we can? Um, it, it's a really good question, Abs. The truth is that I think in my opinion, remember, I'm not a surgeon, that the only absolute contraindication to a dare is where you've got loose components, because everything else, including duration of symptoms, 
or chronicity of infection or the organism, there's a, there's a continuum. So with Staphylococcus aureus, you might have a 60% chance of success as opposed to a Streptococcus, which might be 75% chance, given exactly the same conditions otherwise. And that might be appropriate for that patient. So I don't think, I don't think there's any absolutes other than loose components, um, or of course, where you can't get closure um, at, at any stage. Yeah. That's think of something else. That's, but, no, that's a good we very We very frequently treat Staph aureus or even Pseudomonas, which are chronic, you know, if they're chronic infections with a DARE, that's not our preferred option, but it is possible and it's frequently successful. Yeah. And that takes us to the wound closure issues. Um, someone mentioned sinus tract being a contraindication to DARE. It sometimes is, I would say, only because it would, uh, it would indicate chronicity. But if it was a relatively acute infection with a sinus, Alex, you've had experience in uh, doing uh, gastroc flaps for patients with theirs who've, um, who've, uh, in, uh, who've actually gone on to be cured. And I know that's very anecdotal, but you've, you've been involved in several of those and you've looked at a, a group of them, in fact, haven't you? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, if you do a dare and you get direct wound closure, then you're happy. And if it's a straight line scar over the front of your knee, if it's underneath a flap, if you've got direct primary closure, it's direct primary closure. How, how you achieve that is a bit academic in my opinion. So if you've got good techniques, you've got somebody there who can close the wound for you um, as, as quickly as you can, then I think it's fine to, to use, um, to, to do a day with sinuses. Yeah. And, so, and someone else asked, should we aspirate and uh, uh, incision and drainage this, uh, this staff before doing a dare or crack on without micro sampling pre-op? I would say, I think the best, as Matt said, the best samples you're going to get are at the time of surgery. So a dare needs to be done uh, in a sort of expedited fashion. As Antonia said, uh, the sooner you get to the components, the, the lower the chance of biofilm forming. So if you can get there quickly, get your samples, put patients on them, broad spectrum antibiotics, then that's the best chance you're going to have. And I think that there shouldn't be, um, in the States, it annoys me, sorry, Antonia, that people call it an incision and drainage sometimes, because it's not, it's, it's, it's a proper orthopedic revision operation that has to be done by an experienced surgeon. And these, we used to have people doing dares in the middle of the night. I've done it as a resident. Uh, I didn't know what I was doing, to be honest. And I think the patient had to go back again for further surgery. But, you know, now I've seen the light and you have to consider it as a proper formal operation. You annoy the staff. They all, I, I call it a clean and dirty. Everything has to be put aside. They all get annoyed because they have to bring more instruments, go and get changed and everything. But it's all worth it. Otherwise, there's no point even doing the operation in my in my view and so I think yeah doing it properly even if it means waiting half a day or a day later for an arthroplasty surgeon and a plastic surgeon to come and do it uh, in a, it doesn't need to be done in a in a um, <clears throat> tertiary center um, otherwise everyone will be in, inundated with them all the tertiary centers but it needs to be done uh, in a methodical fashion and it needs to be debrided properly um, one last question Alex go on sorry uh, can I, I was just going to say to Antonia that um, hydrogen peroxide as a solution to wash out. In the UK, we're not allowed to use that because it's associated with air embolus, mainly from gynecologists pouring it into pelvises, to be honest with you, but uh, we're not allowed to put it in. So for the British trainees, don't put hydrogen peroxide into any cavity because um, that will be looked upon very badly. Um, Abtin uh, or, or Antonia, if you could pick one solution to wash out a a PGI with what would it be? I was going to ask Antonia that because <laughs> that's your well, area of expertise. I know you've done a lot of research on it. So I use dilute povidone and iodine for all my primaries. I still do that. I know the data is mixed, but I do that for every one of my cases, and then I wash it out with saline afterwards. Um, I actually there was a study that was done out of Stanford that showed about mixing the different solutions. That's super dangerous. So actually, my go-to is uh, so it's actually I'm going to cheat and do two things: I'm do physical and Willis chemical. I use a Versaget every single time I do a case. I use a Versaget and I clean down all the wounds. They use it for diabetic foot ulcers, things like that. No conflicts of interest with it. I just find it really, really good. The plastic surgeons are the ones that actually have it in our hospital, and so thankfully it exists. I don't have to buy new equipment. I just utilize that for every case. And uh, Dakin solution, hypochloric acid is actually my go-to. Okay. 
yeah, we use the same. We use dilute uh, betadine, and then we also use um, um, high, um, uh, um, uh, hydrogen. <laughs> Chlorhexidine. Chlorhexidine. Sorry. One zero five percent chlorhexidine. One zero five percent. I was I was I was thinking of hydrogen peroxide. Yeah, but we will get put in jail if we do that. We're not allowed. <laughs> Great. So um, to, uh, let's move on to Alex's talk, please. If uh, just just for the sake of time, please uh, put your questions on the question and answers. Alex, please take it away. We're going to talk about the orthoplastics management of PJI. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I, I've got no disclosures, um, apart from to say that there's no classifications or grading systems in my talk. I know orthopedic surgeons love a good classification. There are none in my talk, I'm afraid. Right. So I'm going to talk about why you're going to get a plastic surgeon involved or use plastic surgical techniques, who you're going to get involved, when you're actually going to get us involved, and actually how we're going to solve your problems for you. So... I know, and this is the thing I've learned over a decade, is that if the outside world can see or feel or touch your implant, this is bad. And if you received a nice parcel from Amazon and it was all broken, you'd be really, really upset if the parcel, the cardboard had all fallen to bits. However, if you cover your implant with a really crappy wound that breaks open, sometimes you seem to find this acceptable. And this might involve putting a vac on it. That is not an acceptable package. The orthopedic surgeons, the ID physicians spend so much time scratching their chins, working out what they're going to do. They do these fantastic technical procedures and then they don't have the ability to close wounds and they compromise all of that work they've done before. And what a plastic surgeon could do is to wrap up your beautiful implants in beautiful tissue. So we know that infection leads to fibrosis of the soft tissues. Multiple operations lead to significant scars, multiple tram lines, for example. All of the nice juicy nutrients that's gonna heal that wound is leaking out through that wound. And so this makes these patients very challenging to get their wounds healed. Plastic surgeons, for a living, move tissue around. So we can take the bad tissue, take it away, and we can import good tissue. And that allows rapid wound healing. And that rapid wound healing is really important. So after your operation, if your wound doesn't heal, the patients are not just exposed to their skin flora, but they're exposed to all of the bugs that are in the hospital. And the bugs that are in the bone infection unit, hanging around in the curtains and everywhere else, are particularly nasty. So we don't want anything to be exposed to those. And so rapid wound healing is critical. If you bring in healthy tissue, that healthy tissue has a good blood supply and it brings in antibiotics and it brings an immune system. Scar tissue is hypovascular and doesn't have the same ability to do that. The other thing is that robust wound coverage means that you've got something for the future that's not thin, it's not gonna break down, you've got good, solid, robust tissues for the rest of the life of that implant. So why should you use plastic surgeons? Well, you don't have to use plastic surgeons. If you've got plastic surgical techniques and you can use them yourself, that's fine. But most people in the UK, certainly most orthopedic surgeons will have a limited number of techniques. And one of the things plastic surgeons do is we understand the three-dimensional blood supply to all the different tissues in the body. And that means we can move them around. We can lift them up. We can move them out of the way. So it means that I can get give access the orthopedic surgeons so they can get around the back of joints they don't have to worry about sciatic nerves they can do all sorts of things that they're a little bit frightened to without that knowledge we can move and recruit tissues around so we can fill holes we can cover wounds an obturation of dead space is really important because that dead space if it fills up with fluid or hematoma that's a fantastic culture medium if you obturate that with live tissue then you reduce the risk of your infection coming back. Direct wound closure is important. And the advantage of having a plastic surgeon, they've got the full range of techniques. So if an orthopedic surgeon can do a gastroc flap, everything gets a gastroc flap. If he doesn't know anything else, then you're limited. So this patient here had a latissimus dorsi to cover an anterior shoulder wound. And you can see the scar on the lateral chest wall, and you can see a skin paddle that's been brought in as well. And really, this allows plastic surgeons 
to make sure that the orthopedic surgeons can do what they want to do and they're not concerned about soft tissues. So Antonia mentioned that some of the things in, they may be restricted what they can do orthopedically because of the soft tissues, a plastic surgeon takes that away. And so we're trying to engender this concept of no fear. So the orthopedic surgeons have no fear of the soft tissues. So here's an example of a patient who had a hip replacement. They happened to get a necrotizing fasciitis and they lost most of the skin on the lateral side of their leg and had an exposed implant. With a few plastic surgical tricks and techniques, we can close that wound and we can cover that implant and salvage it. So when are you gonna get plastic surgeons involved? And this is really important. So I want you to get plastic surgeons involved right at the beginning. And so this is in clinic. This is us seeing a patient, so there's a plastic surgeon, there's a consultant ID physician, and there's a consultant orthopedic surgeon. All seeing the patient, all talking to the patient, all talking to each other and explaining their problems to each other. So we all start with a blank sheet of paper and the patient understands what's going on. The next place is the MDT. So you should have an MDT with orthopedic surgeons, plastic surgeons, and ID physicians really as the core with radiologists and all the other associated specialties. So the earlier you can get us, the better it's gonna be. We're quite superficial people in the same way that you would refer a colleague a x-ray and discuss it. You can show us a photograph and we can discuss it. And so we can see flaps, we can assess the soft tissues, we can look at wounds, um, all with photographs. So in the same way that you guys look at x-rays, we can look at photographs and we can certainly come up with good plans from them. When not to involve a plastic surgeon, not too late. So you've got to get in there early. And somebody's going to ask a question about VAX because they always do. Don't rely on VAX. VAX is not a replacement for a plastic surgeon. Generally, it will delay your definitive treatment. So that patient may need the definitive operation and putting a VAC on will only delay that definitive operation. Every time you change the VAC, you'll be introducing new bacteria from the patient's skin or from the hospital into that wound. And there's good evidence to show that then the flora within a wound increases with multiple back change. The other thing that it does, it doesn't really recruit tissue very much. They like to suggest that it does, but it actually makes all of the local tissues quite woody and hard and fibrotic. And that makes it much more difficult to get its wounds closed and more difficult to move that tissue around. So we quite often cut out that rim of fibrotic tissue the vac's produced. And you have to remember the evidence comes from countries where the economics are dubious. So in some countries in Europe, the hospital gets paid a lot of money to do VAC changes. And so the surgeons are encouraged to do multiple VAC changes because their departments get paid very well for it. So there's an economic incentive to do multiple VAC changes. And of course, we always justify what we do. So be careful about the evidence about VAC. So when you should call us, if you're in any doubt, if you look at a wound or a scar and you think, oh, then you should be calling the plastic surgeons. So call early. And this is important because flaps are quite often done at first stages. So if you're going to do a two stage revision, then the flap is often done at the first stage. Don't wait until the second stage and then you think, ah, that took ages to heal the first time. That's going to be difficult. Actually, Get us in early, we can provide definitive soft tissue cover that will then allow you to, when you put your definitive implant in, not be worried about the soft tissues at all. You don't need flaps, you don't need grafts, it's all easy. We can also prevent repeat procedures. So when your first stage fails because the wounds don't heal up, we could have prevented that. So we can get your patients onto the next stage quicker and we can get them out of hospital quicker. So we've got the orthopedic surgeons and doctors trained up pretty well. And here is a patient who had a uh, road traffic accident many years ago. He'd had skin grafting onto vastus intermedius and actually directly onto his femur. Many years later, he develops osteoarthritis of his knee and someone decides to do a knee replacement because of pain. Totally reasonable. He's got terrible soft tissues on the front. And so the first thing that they do is pick up the phone and I go and see the patient and we say, actually, before you even think about doing your knee replacement, I'm going to put a flap on that. And so the patient gets a free flap prior to their procedure. The free flap completely heals and then they just get on, do a normal knee. 
And you can tell that it's a normal knee because this is my free flap here. And the orthopedic surgeons opened it up in a fairly standard orthopedic approach. And you can tell that this is the orthopedic wound because it's got stitch marks down either side from the clips. So actually getting us involved early, we can provide all sorts of solutions for you. How are the plastic surgeons actually going to help you? Or how are we going to get involved? Well, as we said, joint planning is absolutely critical. Getting us there as early as possible when we first see the patient, what's possible, what's not possible. Having joint lists, doing lists together on a regular basis, builds up trust, means we understand what each other's needs are, and it just allows you to put patients on lists easily. Joint follow-up allows us to see our, our, our our results and we can discuss them and see what's working and what isn't. And it allows this idea of mutual respect and learning. And plastic surgeons will not be stepping on orthopedic surgeons' toes. There's not much that I'm gonna be doing that the orthopedic surgeon can do and vice versa. And so actually we're two quite separate specialties and we have completely separate ways of doing things, but we don't step each other's toes. So there's, no, there's no competing there at all. When I, I do a lot of work with different specialties and uh, there's, there's three different types of work that I do. I work with the orthopedic surgeons doing abdominal, sorry, the general surgeons doing abdominal wall reconstruction and they work in a different hospital and do different clinics. And so when they ask me to see a patient, I see them in clinic, they see them in a completely different clinic. I go and operate in a different hospital with them and it's all done by email. It's a right old faff. And that's the old way of doing it. And many units still do that between plastic surgeons and orthopedic surgeons. It's hard work, it's stressful, it's really bad for the patient. It, you don't really learn as quickly, it's very difficult. The next is I work, work with foot and ankle surgeons and they work in the same hospital, in the same theatres, but we don't do joint clinics and we don't do um, uh, regular joint lists. And so every time we see a patient, it has to be specially arranged, we have to see them in clinic. We have to see them on the ward together. We have to fight over what list it's going to go on. And that's better, but it's still hard work. For the osteomyelitis work, I do a joint clinic every week and I do a joint operating list every week. I do an MDT with them every week and it is just easy. And so actually, if you're going to move to a system where you're going to get plastics involved, you need to do it on a regular basis so it's easy. You have joint lists, joint clinics. So how are the plastic surgeons going to help? OK, so we're mainly going to be using flaps. Flaps are three dimensional bits of tissue you move from one part of the body to another. Here's a skin flap based on the lateral calcaneal artery that's covering an Achilles tendon. Um, we can move these bits of tissue around. So that's pretty straightforward. This is a slightly bigger flap. So this is a latissimus dorsi muscle. And you can see I'm pointing out the pedicle. That's a thoracodorsal artery. It's a nice big muscle. And this is going up into a shoulder. This is a prosthetic joint infection. The proximal humerus has been removed. And this is muscle is being passed up over the top of pec major into the um, glenoid fossa to obturate that space and to, to make a new joint. So instead of bone rubbing on bone, this is going to be an interpositional, interpositional muscle arthroplasty based on that flap. Using the same principles, this is a gentleman who's had a fractured neck of femur. He's got an infection. He's had a Girdleston's operation. Unfortunately, the Girdleston's has failed because he's still got an infection. And in the top left rune, you can see that the proximal femur is coming out through a fairly large hole in his thigh. What I can do is once the orthopedic surgeons have removed the infection, they've reamed out the acetabular fossa. The acetabular fossa is this cup that's just gonna sit there and it's gonna fill up with hematoma or seroma. You could put some sort of spacer in there, but the other option is to put vascularized tissue in there. And so what I can do is I can take a vastus lateralis or erectus femoris and put it into that space to obturate the space so it's full of healthy muscle that's delivering antibiotics in the immune system. And if you look at this MRI scan, you can see that this is the muscle going up around the femur and into the acetabular fossa obturating that space. So again, that's very useful for very recurrent um, infections. Once we start moving bits of tissue around, we're limited by the pedicle, which is the artery in the vein keeping that bit of tissue alive. 
So the next logical step is just to cut that artery and vein. And then you have something called a free flap. And a free flap is a bit of tissue you can walk around the operating theatre with. And as long as you've got some blood vessels to join on somewhere else, then you can do that. And with that comes great power to bring in and import virtually any tissue type that you want of virtually any size. And so actually free tissue transfer, whilst it's difficult and it's challenging, actually it gives you great power to do all sorts of reconstructions. So here's three cases just to outline the sorts of things that we would do in Oxford and the cases that I would get involved in. So the first one is someone who's had a total knee replacement, they're obese, they're diabetic, and the orthopedic surgeons feel that they're going to do a one-stage exchange. So this is quite an elderly lady. Uh, she's got a loose implant. So she's going to get a one-stage exchange and she's got a discharging sinus. So I get involved. And you can see that the sinuses is here. That's fairly small. The orthopedic surgeon's open and I'll help them to do that. And once they've um, debrided, taken samples, washed it out, I will roll the leg over whilst the knee joints out so I can get into the posterior aspect of the calf. Here's a, a medial gastrocnemius flap being raised. It's tunneled through in a subcutaneous tunnel to come out of the front. And then that fills the hole where the sinus was. And what it does, it just allows all of the soft tissues around that previous sinus just to relax, get a better blood supply, and the rest of the wound just closes directly and a skin graft is taken from the same thigh. So that all takes place at the same time and it takes me about an hour and a half to uh, raise and tunnel a gastroc and actually close the wound and you've got direct primary closure in virtually about the same time after the implant goes in as the orthopedic closure. Case two, this is a, a an elderly patient who had a total knee replacement in 2017, fell at four weeks, the wound broke open. She then had a dare, grew some staph epidermidis. Then she had a redo dare in November. Then she had a quads rupture in November. And then she had another a redo, redo dare in December uh, 2017. She's diabetic, obese. She's got some peripheral neuropathy. She mobilizes with a Zimmer frame. So not a great candidate. And she's referred to a plastic surgeon to say, please, can you cover this wound? Yeah, I can cover the wound, but actually there's no point in me covering any wound with residual infection and a prosthetic joint infection. So actually this needs to go through an orthoplastics approach. We need to get the orthopedic surgeons involved properly to do this. And this is the, uh, all the sutures from the quads rupture and the dead bit of quads that was used. This is the implant. All of this comes out. And here I am actually pretending to be an orthopedic surgeon by knocking out some implants. So I've got a vague idea of my way around the knee. But actually, this is joint working. We're making a big hole on the front of the knee. And then I raise a, another medial gastrocnemius flap, tunnel it through. My hand goes through a nice broad tunnel. The um, implant goes in. This is a fusion nail. And so the gastrocnemius is just sitting there waiting to go in the right place. And as soon as the um, implant is secured, then the gastrocnemius closes the wound. And so the flap covers the, the implant. You have a skin graft over the top of that. This is the patient at two weeks post-op, and this is a patient at three months post-op. And she was infection-free at two years. Case three, getting slightly more complex now, but again, this is kind of standard fare, really. Um, this is a chap who in 1971 had an open tibial fracture. He's got an infection of his proximal tibia at that time. He had some bone grafting in 1987, complicated by infection. Someone did a one-stage tibial osteotomy and total knee replacement in 2000, so that's 20 years ago. Fairly predictably, he got a delayed union from his osteotomy due to infection. And he's now got ongoing knee pain and weakness. He's got a discharging sinus and he's got no good distal pulses, and that's from a previous vascular injury at the time of his original open tibial fracture. He's traveled around the world to various places to get opinions, and eventually rocks up on our, our shores, and that's his um, x-ray. So uh, all, all of this is infected, all of this knee is infected, he's got a discharging sinus, he's got terrible skin, uh, so I'm going to get involved in this case. 
This is more than a gastrocnemius can do. And so we're upgrading now to free flaps to bring in extra tissue. This is at the resection. This is his proximal tibia, and you can see it's uh, got osteomyelitis. Um, I can raise a latissimus dorsi muscle flap of pretty much any size you want. So this is a flap that's about 30 centimeters long um, with a pedicle. This is a resection, a tumor star prosthesis is placed um, from the distal femur down to the uh, distal tibia. And all of those soft tissues are completely relaxed. We're not gonna try and close those because we know that they're not gonna heal. And so we just put a free flap over the top. And actually, whilst this is a long procedure, the orthopedic part is quite long, plastic surgery part is quite long as well. Actually, it gives them a one stage operation to get this done with definitive wound closure. Here's a gentleman at three years following this procedure and he's still infection free and he's got good function in his knee. And whilst he hasn't got the best cosmetic result, actually, he's got a fantastic functional result without infection. So in summary, uh, why, why do you want to get plastic surgery involved? Well, you want rapid wound healing, and that's essential in this uh, treatment. Who, I think, plastic surgeons, I think you have to have a plastic surgeon who's able, and some of these operations are quite scary for the plastic surgeon, so you need to get someone who is happy to take on the risk. They need to be available, so they need to be around, and you need to have access to them on a regular basis, and you need someone who you're actually going to get on with. I apologise on behalf of some plastic surgeons who are a bit... Um, a bit on the spectrum, one might say, but actually you need someone who you can get on with and, and develop a good working relationship with. When? Straight away, at the beginning, before you put your vac on it. And also, how are we going to do it? Well, we've got a whole bunch of different flap techniques, and they're just some of them we've, we've, we've touched on. So thank you very much. It's a pleasure. I hope that was interesting. Great. Thank you, Alex. That was more than interesting. Some familiar faces and some familiar cases there. Um, uh, Matt, Antonio, if you could come on, thank you. Um, so the key messages there were, you know, uh, the VAC needs to be uh, a last resort or if not used at all, don't use a VAC. Um, call the sur plastic surgeons early, find someone you can work with uh, regularly in order to be able to Get a, get a go on to these sort of cases. Great principles there. Um, Antonia, how um, closely do you guys work with plastic surgeons or do you, the orthopedic surgeons in the States uh, prefer to do their own flaps or what's, what's your working relationship? Speed dial. <laughs> so we work with our plastic surgeons pretty frequently. Now it, it is institution dependent. Some surgeons feel pretty comfortable about raising their own gastroc flaps. And so they will actually do that part when it gets more sophisticated, especially free flaps. We definitely call our plastic surgery colleagues. You guys are way better at that than we are. We don't have the training for microvascular at all. And I guarantee our flaps would die. So we rely on you guys very, very heavily. We're thankful for it. Um, and, uh, and it's a nice thing to have, but this is where having a tertiary center, a bigger center where there's, you know, more individuals involved makes a bigger difference, um, in other facilities, they may not have that. And that's why they end up doing their own flaps. Yeah. Thank you, Matt. Do you think that all these bone infections should be dealt with then in tertiary centers or obviously the, the ones that need all the plastics? Yes. But what do you think are the limits of trying to manage this increasing workload. I mean, logistically, it's not going to be possible to deal with every single infection in a tertiary center. What, what's your thoughts on this? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, it's a good question. The, the um, I tell you, the kings of this are probably the French people. Gérard Depardieu's son once got a bone infection, and as a result of, of this very high-profile case, they built up a beautiful network where in, in each region or département of France, they've got a specialist unit. We're trying to get the same sort of idea uh, in the United Kingdom, because I think a hub and a spoke um, arrangement is really, really important, and it keeps all the different centers talking to each other. The big question is who should go to a tertiary center and who should be managed in, in, in their local center? And there's a guy called Andrew Hotchin, who together with some of the other guys in Oxford have built this fantastic uh, thing called the J.S. Bach classification, looking at four different domains um, to try and help guide who should be referred to a specialist unit and who could be maintained in their local unit. And it based essentially upon either the joint or the bone and the extent of the infection, um, the antibiotic that you might need in uh, the uh, so soft tissue uh, 
um, envelope and, um, and the host. And based on a combination of those four things in a relatively simple format, there's a very, very clear indication as to which one should be referred and which one shouldn't. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, uh, it, you know, it brings in things like the host, the type of surgery, the uh, local, the, the need for plastics and the type of bug. So that, yeah, that paper should be published hopefully soon. And uh, it really uh, distill, distills these sort of difficult cases. Um, Antonia, I know you're, you're in the middle of your day and you have to go. So I'm going to try and uh, push you with one last question before I can let you go. What do you think is, is the future uh, sort of of PJI? What's the next milestone going to be? You touched on it briefly. You talked about phages. We talked about irrigation fluids. Do you think it's going to be in surgery or do you think it's going to be with, with something else? I know you've got a big molecular uh, science background. What's your thoughts about that? I think it's going to come at that le level. It's going to be molecular. It can't be at the big macro level. There's only so much we can do as surgeons. I wish we could cure everything, but just because there's a nail doesn't mean we have to hit it with a mallet. Um, and of course, it's an orthopedic viewpoint, and that's not what we're going to be able to do. But it's going to be all the adjuvants that's being building up in all different areas, all the you know antimicrobials, um, not just antibiotics, but antimicrobials. I think that are going to really make a difference. And again, that's going to lead us to dare, right? For everyone, I still think we're going to need surgery to remove some of that bio burden, remove a lot of the tissue that's infected. I don't think it's going to go away. There's still going to be wounds that are dehist. Alex is going to be still very busy closing a lot of these wounds. Um, but I think it's really going to come down to something more sophisticated than what we have now because what we've had so far has been good but it hasn't worked well enough yeah i agree matt what do you think similar i think so oh, i i i mean the buzzword at the moment i think is uh what's called individualization or i can't remember what the word is but that i think i think every patient will be offered a a, a very bespoke solution to their particular program and as antonia said it's, it might involve bacteria phages might involve nanoparticles and a whole lot of other stuff that's uh, that, that's currently in development. Brilliant. Yeah, I agree. I think it's going to be have to move away from just chopping things out. And I think the uh, future is going to be uh, molecular diagnostics, same as for cancers. Same again, that brings together what, what you were talking about, managing these things like cancers, like uh, tumors uh, in, in specialist centers for difficult cases and also looking at modern diagnostics and molecular techniques. Uh, I think there's, there's a lot to be said about prevention as well, actually, and the simple things that people can do and just get everybody doing the simple things. And actually that reduces the burden of infection by reducing the number of patients. And obviously the number of old patients going up, the number of implants is only going to go in one direction. So actually little reductions in infection in, at the original surgery, the first surgery, make a huge difference later on. Yeah, I agree. We didn't go over that. That's a webinar in itself, but prevention of PJI is uh, another big one. Hopefully we'll do one of those in the future. Well, brilliant. Thank you very much, everyone. I wanted to thank Matt Scarborough, Antonia Chen, Alex Ramsden, Carla, Ramon, Cash, and the OrthoHop team. Thank you, everyone, for the uh, attendees. If there's any questions, please do email us. And uh, this talk will hopefully be go on and will be available to view again in the future. OK, thank you very much and have a good night. Thanks for having us. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Abs. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs>